India a couple of times and so much enjoyed it. And uh, just wanted to say how much I've enjoyed joining some of your broadcasts. Oh, the resilience um, lectures. And Fantastic. in fact, I was just watching one about Kapurthala oh. just now, before yes. this. So, yes. Um, thank you very much for allowing us to join. Oh, you know, you're, you're very, very welcome. You know, the thank whole you. lecture series is only, um, only works so well because of the interest of our audience. And um, I really feel we are offering a forum um, to the um, erstwhile royal families because they simply disappeared with independence. And um, there is this kind of voyeuristic interest in them, but we mm -hmm. want to have a serious kind of study of them and the properties. And um, so it's been a really fantastic journey. And Kapotala has been a wonderful support to us. They've put together the most wonderful program. So we are planning a summer school, something like the Attingham School, of course, you know, just this kind of yes. junior version well, of it. I, I have been to Kapotala and uh, I have been to, to see them there, so uh, oh. it was wonderful. But uh, it's so great to see the development of the heritage industry in, in India and uh, recognizing the wonderful things that, that they have there. Yes. So, uh, thank, you the, the, thank you again. Thank you. Right. Wonderful. We can start our session. Hello, everyone. My name is Esther Schmidt. I'm the director of the Center for Historic Houses I'm in, in India. I'm very excited about this event. This is day three of our program, Great Minds and Heritage and Historic Houses. Today, uh, we've got our education panel uh, with museum pedagogy at the Frick Collection to exciting digital learning opportunities at the Smithsonian Digital Learning Lab, Education for the Art Market at Sotheby's Institute of Art, and to a reflection on new audiences at Historic Houses as part of the Oxford University Heritage Network, and new concepts of heritage management at the Center for Heritage Management at Anderwald University. So uh, this is a kind of mini conference that we've spread out over several days. So I'd like to just tell you a little bit about what happened before. You might be surprised that there is no overall thematic approach for our lecture series. But the reason behind the title, Great Minds and Heritage and Historic Houses, is that the historic houses themselves and those who care for them are meant to be the focal point of our discussion. In our lecture series, we have invited people who have made important contributions in thinking and writing about or caring for historic houses, their collections and the people associated with them. Others have been active in ensuring their existence through concrete efforts of conversation, management, interpretation and reinterpretation or through new design efforts or adaptive reuse. Their work, our work is meaningful but also because of how communities are affected by these initiatives. In many conversations with owners of historic houses, the concept of community and the relevance of community has fundamentally changed during the pandemic. Recent debates um, from the pandemic to political events have caused us all to rethink our roles and the purpose and contributions of the historic houses or the institutions we are associated with and to what extent we need to rediscover or possibly revise some of these original ideas. Yesterday in our curation panel, we heard about the little known Asian art collection at the Louvre. For those of you familiar with Asian art in France, you will know that Asian art in Paris is found primarily at the Musée Guimet. Asian art objects at the Louvre are those of specific European connections, for example, Chinese wares with bronze mounds. The Louvre also houses the fantastic collection of Marie Antoinette's lacquer boxes, part of which are also at Versailles. A collection she inherited from her mother, Maria Theresia, ruler of the House of Habsburg, and later expanded on her own. Other highly rare objects of exceptional beauty belong to specific collections. And I really want to emphasize that with 
you know, despite all the political context, I think we still need this kind of sense of awe and wonder about the objects in themselves. Objects can resurface in different contexts in different periods. They can assume different meanings, enter into unique relationships with their new owners. And unlocking these hidden histories and their significance needs to incorporate multiple narratives. With Janice and Canada's interpretation of colonial Williamsburg and her analysis of the invisible history related to slavery, we continue to explore how the story of objects relates to the owner as well as to the larger context. Whose stories do we tell? And what stories do we tell? And perhaps Loki, you can share some of the slides um, that I uh, that I sent you if you have them. Yeah, sure, no problem. Thanks. And if we focus on one of them, in one of the narratives, how do we ensure that one narrative doesn't overpower the multiple stories that are part of every historic house? Thank you. Um, so this is the overview of the lecture series. Perhaps you can go to the next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so this is uh, what I mean. So here we have um, uh, Mahmoudabad estate, and this is also the story of loss. It is also the story um, of partition. It is one of these invisible stories that I mentioned earlier. And almost everything is gone in this house, except a few collection of books that are in a very poor condition. We also have very challenging climate here in, in India. And these books are currently digitized um, as part of a British library uh, project. And um, on the right, you see a fantastic museum. It's one of the best collections of 18th century French furniture at the Musée Nissin du Camondo in Paris. But when you go there, you probably come across a photograph of um, this lady there on the horse. Beatrice um, de Camondo, and um, she uh, grew up in that house, and then that whole house was donated and opened to the public by her um, uh, relatives in 1936, and in 1944 she, um, she was killed at Auschwitz. So how do we deal with this? We have this collection of 18th century furniture, but we also have the story of the owner um, and the owners associated with that. Or what you see here on the left, um, how is this related to colonialism? This is something that Sir Edwin Lutchens designed um, for the nursery at uh, Rashtra Pati Bhavan, the former vice regal palace. How is this connected um, to colonialism? What story can we tell or what other stories? What inspired the, the design? Is this also part of the design history unrelated to political events? Um, thank you. Um, sorry, let me just... So uh, Loki, um, thank you. If you can uh, stop sharing, please, because I won't be able to see my screen with the text. Thank you. So we looked at these different contexts in invisible histories yesterday in the magnificent displays of the Hillwood estate in the US of a collection closely linked to Marjorie Merriweather, Merriweather Post, who bought the estate in 1955 and her collection of 18th century decorative arts and Russian imperial art. Curator Rebecca Tills highlighted the innovative curatorial practice to juxtapose the permanent collection with changing exhibitions in response to the taste and persona of the original owner, but also to current concerns. Hillwood Estate is participating in several partnerships and collaborative projects, including research on their original collection of furniture with the Wallace Collection in London. The purpose behind our lecture series is to build bridges we are currently establishing a network of historic house museums in India with a particular focus on palace museums and forts. And we were very excited to have had a presentation about City Palace Museum in Jaipur presented by Rinalini Venkateswaran. By building bridges, I'm referring to a discussion between Asia and the West, although much needed and not only in connection with the past in the context of colonialism, but also in ways forward and meaningful collaborations to create constructive futures. However, by building bridges, I'm also referring to the various stakeholders involved in the care, promotion, revival and interpretation of historic houses. Sometimes these roles and discourses can differ profoundly and can be at odds with each other. Let us listen to these different voices. Let us not forget to celebrate 
what brought us to the study and care of historic buildings and heritage in the first place, our curiosity and passion for them. And I'd like to finish this um, short introduction uh, with the quotation that we just heard recently by um, the owner of Palazzo Parisio in Malta, who in our view, um, they started some of the most innovative responses to the pandemic. And she said, I'm really grateful um, to what my grandfather left with us, you know, with his palazzo, but let's get on with it. And um, for these words, let's get on with it. And um, I'm curious to see what you have. I'd like to start with um, um, Caitlin. Um, Caitlin is, um, we met her uh, during the pandemic because she took us on a fantastic virtual tour um, to the Frick Collection. Um, and um, she is currently finishing her PhD at Harvard University, has had very impressive fellowships, um, including at the Villa Tati, and um, is now um, an education um, curator at uh, the Frick Collection. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you for this invitation um, to speak, and I'm so looking forward to hearing everyone's presentations. Um, let me just begin to show my screen here. Okay. All right. Um, I'd like to begin just by introducing the Frick Collection for those who may be less familiar with this museum. Um, it is the Frick Collection in New York City um, is sometimes referred to as a house museum, as it's located in what was once the private residence of the Pittsburgh coal and steel magnate Henry Clay Frick. So this Beaux-Art mansion was built by Thomas Hastings of the firm Carrer and Hastings in 1913-1914. It's located at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 70th Street. Frick, whom you see here on the left, um, lived here for just five years with his wife, Adelaide, and his daughter, Helen, um, whom you see on the right. Um, he lived here from 1914 to 1919. However, his widow lived on until 1931. So its life as a private home lasted 17 years. The Frick's now been a museum um, for the last 85 years, having opened to the public in 1935 in accordance with Frick's will. And here I'm sharing you some of the founding language from that will. Um, I've bolded the passages that articulate the museum's public mission, um, the goal to create a public gallery of art for the use and benefit of all persons whomsoever. Frick said that he wanted this museum to be his monument and he bequeathed both the house and his extraordinary collection of European paintings, sculpture and decorative art to create it. It houses celebrated works by artists such as Rembrandt, Bellini, Ang, Velasquez, Fragonard. And here I'm showing you the room that houses Fragonard's Progress of Love paintings. And on this slide with a comparison between a, 19, a historic photograph from 1927 and the year 2007, you can see that in general, little is changed from its appearance in the house, uh, save for a few stanchions here and some new acquisitions. The museum has continued to add to the collection since Frick's death. So despite this tipping of the scales, despite the fact that the Frick has now been a museum for much longer than it was ever a private home, this refined domestic atmosphere of the late Gilded Age is maintained in the galleries. This is the grand staircase that connects the first and the second stories. Uh, throughout the museum's history, only the first floor has ever been open to the public, but we are currently embarked on a renovation project that will see the second floor becoming open um, to visitors and open for the display of works of art as well. So here in the living hall, you can see that characteristic mixture of paintings, sculpture, pieces of decorative art, household furniture, all gathered in an immersive aesthetic ensemble with an absolute minimum of interpretive intervention. Um, you'll notice the absence of wall text, of labels, as well as sound dampening carpets and light shading drapes. This is, I think, about as far from the maximally neutral white cube gallery aesthetic as one can get. And it's also certainly distinct from the echoey marble halls of many national um, or municipal art museums. Um, internal records show that 
striking this balance was a priority from the beginning, right, as the mansion was being transformed into the museum in the years 1931 to 1935. The first director, Frederick Mortimer Clapp, sought to facilitate the public's access to art without utterly museumizing the building, stripping it down and, you know, reducing the atmosphere of an elite home. Um, and that term museumizing is actually drawn from one of Clapp's uh, 1935 memos. Of course, the Frick is not unique in this. Um, there are other museums like the Wallace Collection in London, um, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, and the Musée Commando that you mentioned earlier, Mimi, um, that have similar institutional histories and also present works of art in elite domestic settings. And I think that museum educators who teach in these environments face fascinating challenges. Namely, in a place where so many histories come together, art histories and American histories, Atlantic histories, um, the history of the Gilded Age, individual object histories that stretch from 1300 to 1900, um, and the very history of Western European art and the formation of that canon, how do you do justice to it? And moreover, how do you teach inclusively in a space that so clearly conveys exclusivity? So with what remains of my time, I'd like to speak to some of the work that we have done in the education department to address this. So educators at the Frick practice an object-centered, close-looking pedagogy that involves taking long looks at single works of art, beginning with quiet observation, followed by open conversation facilitated by a gallery teacher who contributes information drawn from their own study of the object. An hour long visit would usually include no more than three objects so that students can delve deeply into their own curiosity. Something that we noticed while teaching in this way was that students attention sometimes turned understandably to the object setting which reads as distinctive and historic and opulent. So a close look at works by Rembrandt and Vermeer uh, might also prompt observations about the room they were in, um, about perhaps its original function, speculations, questions about who lived in this house, how much it cost, where that money came from, and why Frick bought what he did. We of course wanted to honor students' curiosity and speak clearly about our origins um, while maintaining this object-centered pedagogy. Um, so we sought ultimately to deepen our understanding of our institutional history and revise our approach to introducing the Frick in order to better honor those interests. We learned that many of the Frick's gallery teachers were hesitant to share much of our founding story with students, worrying that information about Henry Clay Frick's great wealth, um, the history of his labor op opposition, might overshadow experiences with works of art. Um, and perhaps more to the point, many of us who were teaching in the galleries were trained as art historians, and therefore we knew more about Medici Florence or Tudor England than we did about late 19th century Pittsburgh or turn of the century New York. So we built up primary and secondary sources on the Gilded Age, the development of big business, and here you see um, some period illustrations, signs for the H.C. Frick Coke Company. Frick's fortune came from um, Western Pennsylvania's rich coal deposits. He was involved in the production of Coke, um, which is a coal derivative um, that was used as the fuel for the steel industry. And you see some of the, the dangerous um, and, and dirty conditions in which many of these workers um, were, were active. Um, Pittsburgh at the time was described by one observer as hell with the lid blown off. And I think we, we kind of arrive at some of that here with this, with this image. Um, we also particularly sought to deepen our understanding of the uh, homestead strike, um, which was an episode in Frick's life um, for which he was notorious in 1892. Um, in pursuing, um, in seeking to open up a plant where workers were striking for better wages and better working conditions. Um, Frick sent in a private militia, the Pinkerton security guards, um, who floated down the river on the barge to open up the plant. You see that here um, on the bottom right. Um, and violence broke out, uh, nine or 10 men died. 
and this was national news. Um, so for many people in Frick's own day, um, this is, is an episode that was um, closely associated with the Frick name, um, something that I think can be, can be easy to forget um, in a space like this that tends to um, erase thoughts of violence, um, violence and danger. So we were seeking to represent this history as accurately as we did that of Henry Clay Frick's collecting. And so we began to apply our close looking pedagogy to the space itself, not only to individual works of art. We invited students to respond first to their surroundings. Um, and we found that gathering these first impressions was very fruitful. Observations about the home's elegance presented opportunities to share information about the source of Frick's wealth and to note how exceptional a home like this was in a time of great income inequality. It also inspired students to comment on the taste on display, which some identified as Eurocentric. And indeed, Frick's taste was very culturally bounded to the Western European tradition. Students visiting the Frick have suggested that his collecting might represent a desire to participate in traditions associated with hereditary European aristocracies and perhaps even attempts to rehabilitate his public image. Others have noted that the private wealth that is so clearly displayed at the Frick underpins the foundation of other museums and public institutions as well. And so in this way, an exploration of institutional history in the space of a house museum is prompting students to engage critically, not just with their immediate surroundings, but also with museums more broadly. Another, asp another element um, that this project raised for us was it prompted some critical thinking within the education department of the, the histories that we, um, that we were focused on telling, certainly the histories of objects in the collection, but also kind of attending to the framing of the Frick story and the story of the museum. You know, in thinking about Frick's involvement in industry, we realized that perhaps we were thinking too narrowly about the workers um, in Pittsburgh. In fact, our very site, this mansion, this three-story mansion with three people living full-time um, was serviced by a staff of about 30. And those were stories that were largely unknown at the Frick collection. Um, and so we became aware that our, our histories, the histories we were telling, uh, at least of the mansion, were really dominated by architects, not builders, by owners, not workers. Um, and in many ways, that's, that makes sense given that um, there are very few traces in any of these galleries of um, the work that went into running the home. And I'm showing you here just a few traces that exist um, behind the sofas in the West Gallery, which I was just showing you. These are call buttons, mother of pearl, um, that connected um, Henry Clay Frick, his guests, his family, um, to this, this staff of 30. And we're talking about hundreds of people who worked, um, who lived and worked on site over the course of those 17 years in which um, the Frick Mansion um, served as a private home. Um, and so this has now prompted within the education department um, research into the histories of those people who were working for the Fricks. Um, and you see we're relying here on the Frick family papers within the archives um, of our institution that record payroll, correspondence, um, uh, expenses, things like that, that tell more of a story of the running of the home. Um, and this is I think well-trodden ground within historic houses, but because the Frick was so deliberately and self-consciously very intentionally created as an art museum, rather than as a temple to the life of Henry Clay Frick or the, uh, the way his family lived in this home, um, this is material that's new to us, that's new for our understanding of this place. Some of you may know that the Frick in um, pursuing this expansion project has closed its doors at 1 East 70th Street at our home site and moved temporarily um, to the Marcel Breuer designed building at 945 Madison Avenue. And I'm showing you um, our incarnation as Frick Madison now. We are opening to the public tomorrow. Um, and I hope that when, um, when you are able to visit New York um, that you might see the Frick in this starkly new setting. 
Um, and I also just wanted to note that much of what I've presented here um, is drawn from an article published this past summer with my co-author, Rachel Himes, a former colleague in my department. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to look there. I'd be happy to share that reference um, with Mimi and the rest of the participants um, if folks would like to learn more. Thank you. Fantastic, Caitlin. Thank you so much. And yes, please do share the reference. I'm sure lots of people will be interested in this. Very insightful. Of course, I'm really interested in seeing now what will happen in the new context with a new uh, with a new building and how people respond to this. I've read lots of enthusiastic responses, you know, on social media and so on. So I'm curious uh, to follow up. Um, I thank you so much. I'd now like to welcome um, Anne Marie Richard who is an art historian and curator, author, and the interim director of the Sotheby's Institute of Art. Her expertise is particularly uh, European decorative arts. And I'm very curious to, her, to hear her presentation on education in, in the field of the art market. Oh, good morning or good evening, rather. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm quite honored to be amongst all of you. And uh, let me share my screen. Uh, I will sh start uh, immediately with my presentation. Anna, we just make sure you've got the presentation view, right? Can you see my screen? Yes. So just as a quick uh, introduction, um, I am now the uh, interim director of the Sotheby's Institute of Art for New York. I'm also the master's program director for fine art, decorative arts and design at the Institute. And I oversee the master's in art business as well. Um, the auction house was founded in 1744. And in 1969, they decided to implement an educational branch uh, within the auction house. And that program was called the Works of Art course. I'm a graduate of that course, uh, which no longer exists. Now everything has been restructured under three different master's program. But the foundation of the Works of Art course is still alive within uh, the program of Fine Art, Decorative Arts and Design where uh, we study historic homes and their collections, collectors and objects and the stories that they tell. So what we strive to do uh, at the uh, Institute is build an ecosystem of knowledge and skills, uh, bearing in mind that the school, while well, has a very strong academic um, implementation, is also geared towards people who will end up working in the trade, in the, the commercial end of the art business. But what never changes is that we have a foundation of art history, connoisseurship, art market research, and art law within the three programs. Uh, the paintings that I chose to illustrate this slide is uh, on the left, um, a wonderful picture by uh, Adrian Isebrand that is located in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which illustrates um, one of the first uh, composition to portray a professional activity. And uh, the, the title of this painting is Man Weighing Gold. It's from uh, approximately uh, 1515. And the slide to the right uh, is by a woman painter, an underrepresented category of the 19th century named Emily Osborne. And the painting illustrates a widow, as you can see, she's wearing black with her child. Uh, she is an artist and she's going to um, the local art dealer to sell her paintings. And I think between these two pictures, it really illustrates grosso modo uh, how we how we teach and what we teach and the mission of our teaching. The under layers of all these images and objects. So the pedagogy of learning at the Institute and when I did the course, the works of our course has never changed. It's always been object handling. Now we are on pause because of the world uh, sanitary pandemic, but uh, once the world reopens, we shall go back 
uh, to this way of learning where uh, you see on the left, this is one of my class, we go to the auction house and we talk to the uh, specialist, be it silver or ceramic or oil master paintings and the students handle the objects to feel how they weigh, how they are made, how they are marked and uh, really observed from close proximity what, what these objects um, really feel like. And uh, to the right, we have a slide of um, a specialist, which uh, is what a lot of our students end up being at the end of the day. If they don't work at the auction house or one of the auction houses, there are several within New York City and outside of New York, of course. Um, some of them exceptionally end up working in museums. A lot of them end up working in uh, art and finance, in banks, which have um, many, many uh, collections of art that need to be managed and appraised. So uh, we also, not just uh, outside of the objects, the traditional objects, we also uh, teach uh, jewelry, gems and jewelry. Uh, of course, this is also on pause right now because we are reassessing how we will go moving forward after the pandemic, um, how many students will be allowed within um, showrooms and back rooms of diamond cutters and um, jewelry dealers within the city. And the, the picture to the right uh, are hands of my students touching a wall. And that is one thing that we can still do, examine public monuments around the city and look at architecture. As you know, decorative arts derives from architecture and the materials that you might find in buildings sometimes may translate into objects dart as well. So it's very important that even though we are in a pandemic, there are still things that we can do until the world reopens. Another um, panel of our um, way of teaching is to take uh, field studies trips. So when I was a student, um, my first uh, category of expertise was uh, Chinese and Japanese and Korean ceramics. And I was invited to Burley House to handle the objects and discuss them. And in London, that is still something uh, that the students do uh, and will resume doing uh, once it's safe for everyone to do. In New York, we travel around the city to all the historic homes. Uh, so that would be Merchant's House in New York City, for example, outside of New York, perhaps Bosco Bell. And we would take longer trips to go to Rhode Island to visit uh, the Newport houses. Uh, for example, I'm just showing uh, Rough Point, which was um, Doris Duke's residence in, uh, in Newport, which was built uh, in the 1890s, uh, which is filled with um, European decorative arts as well as Islamic art and Asian works of art. So how do we teach art for our future art specialists during a world pandemic? Well, one thing that has never changed is the component of art history. And we have a very strong library and especially many, many, many subscription to e-resources. So the pandemic has kind of had us double down on research, which is very good for the students until the world reopens. So I'm just showing you um, one of the examples of the subscriptions we have, the JSTOR. Uh, we have a close relationship with the Watson Library. The Watson Library has a very good uh, digitalized um, archival materials, just as uh, the Frick does. Um, so that's all very important. We are teaching them how to access this information without uh, feeling insecure about their future thesis or capstone projects. Uh, provenance is a, a big part of what we teach as well, because uh, being uh, in the art trade, uh, everything has to be vetted and uh, authenticated, uh, authenticated, pardon me. And uh, that is related to the science of provenance research. So we have students that actually now work at the Getty Foundation that were trained at the Institute and that know how to access these resources. So digitally, you can access to a lot of uh, material 
and also uh, by appointment. Uh, one of the uh, slides I'm showing is some of the, uh, the Nodler records kept at the Frick. A few years ago, I led a class on archival sources around the city. And one of our pit stops was obviously the Frick uh, archives, where we went in a very small group, of course, um, and the books were open for us. But these resources are also available online right now. Many museums and and libraries are just digitalizing uh, at an incre incredible speed. And uh, the book of jewelry to the uh, right is actually a book that was of patterns that was exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is also open uh, at a limited capacity, but there's still a lot of material that is accessible. Um, being uh, related to an auction house, of course, we have a very large library of auction catalogs and art gallery catalogs, and that those catalogs are incredible sources for provenance research and um, also for the history of the art market, as many of these catalogs uh, have uh, the pre-sale estimates uh, printed in the catalog, either in a separate page or within the catalog. And uh, we also have a large uh, collection of price lists. So we can actually do retrospective market research. We also teach the language of art. Uh, so the terminology of uh, decorative arts, for example, I'm just uh, using uh, auction house description of this uh, Empire Armelou mounted Sèvres porcelain Guéridon, Table des Palais Royaux, commissioned by Napoleon I assigned and inscribed Manufacture Royale de Sèvres 1816. All of this um, quote unquote jargon is explained in class. We dissect and really teach our students what is the language of art, just like there's a language of business, there's a language of trade and commerce, there is a language of decorative arts. So the glossary of terminology is incredibly important. I picked these two um, pictures uh, because they also represent um, how we teach, uh, looking at objects, contemplating the objects and understanding the compositions, the colors, their context within um, history. Uh, so we have the ambassadors um, of 1550, uh, 1533 of um, Hans Holbein the Younger. And for example, you have at the base of one of the ambassador this um, anamorphic uh, rendition of a skull. So we will go into explaining, explaining uh, exactly what that means and the history of uh, this type of um, composition. And uh, to the left, we have James Drummond, uh, The Return of Mary Queens of Scots to Edinburgh of 1870, which is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is an unfinished painting. But there's a lot of history within that unfinished uh, painting, not just from a compositional point of view, but also from a market point of view. This is a picture that was for many years misattributed. It was um, cataloged improperly and passed for uh, what I called anonymous, 19th century anonymous. And until scholarly research was probably properly conducted, uh, nobody paid attention to this picture. It, it, it was bought in a couple of times until it was finally properly catalogued and sold at um, auction and eventually um, purchased by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Objet d'art, so there's the whole history uh, of uh, their functions, uh, their patronage, who commissioned them, what was the artist's intent, uh, were they objects just for the pleasure and the enlightenment of the user, or were they just uh, made to show the, the skill of the craftsman? So we have uh, James Cox, uh, 1765, um, a mechanical uh, automaton clock in the collection of Rough Point. And uh, we have the famous Cellini salt, which was stolen and then uh, returned. Uh, which is an incredible uh, example of uh, mythology and um, I would say um, uh, sea and earth combined. You have this, this this entire world in this in this object, and the history is quite fascinating. Uh, it's now in the Kunsthistorisch Museum, but was initially 
uh, commissioned by Francis I, who's also re responsible for commissioning the Mona Lisa. So there's this whole world just around these objects that we explain and share with our students. So they understand how to contextualize not just history, but also contemporary art, uh, which brings me to design. So for example, uh, the uh, Damien Hirst uh, diamond skull, which is uh, the iconography is within uh, the category of memento mori. So we can go back in time and explain this work of art also from a market point of view. And then we have the Haas brothers, um, the California twins uh, that design uh, these curious objects, um, which uh, may or may not relate to the idea of the cabinet of curiosity uh, in the material, the ebony that's used for the horns, the bronze and, and the fur, uh, the natural history aspect of the object. We also teach artist studios and palettes, how they're used. Um, everything uh, starts with an idea, with a line. The materials, these are pastels from uh, 1905, of French pastels. And to the right, we have Magna acrylic paint, which um, was conceived in the 40s and uh, ended uh, its manufacture in the 1970s. Materials is a big, 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 big part of uh, the science of authentication and the science of processes, artists' processes and techniques. We also teach techniques of art because if you don't know the techniques, how can you talk about something when you don't know how it is made? So I chose here to illustrate this point, a miniature Roman chalcedony head mounted on an enamel gold bust, which is actually a married piece. The Roman head is from the late first century and the bust is a 16th century Italian um, confection. And to the right, we have a, a Belle Epoque uh, drawing that is uh, entirely conceived uh, by blotting and wash on paper. So there is absolutely no outline in this work on paper. It is now in the Van Gogh Museum. Uh, and it's, it was one of the works that was exhibited at TIFAF through the, the booth of uh, Stephen Hongpin, who is a, a very well-known um, old master drawing and 19th century drawing dealer, who's also one of our graduate. Notions of conservation and restoration are always uh, mentioned in our classes, whether in contemporary art, in fine art and decorative arts, or in the masters of art business. What is condition? What is conservation? What is restoration? The tiers of con condition in corresponding value, because we are, we are market centric. Uh, are we looking at objects that have a cultural value or are considered a financial asset? And how will breakage or uh, restoration or conservation impact that value moving forward? What is considered acceptable in the market? What is a craquelure that is uh, natural, that shows the natural age of a painting? And uh, what is a seam that's been perhaps poorly uh, repaired? How much does it impact? What, what is museum condition? What is uh, academic condition? What is considerable desirable in the market within different categories? So these objects might to somebody that, that doesn't understand the object be considered in very poor condition. While in fact, these are quite desirable objects if you're interested in American decorative arts where condition is really in the eye of the beholder in that something that looks not pristine, but that shows normal wear is actually what is considered marketable and desirable. These are 18th century uh, uh, works of art from Rhode Island and from Massachusetts. And they, they, fetch, they fetch quite a pretty penny at auction. We also study signatures and stamps. So here, what is a collector stamp? What is an estate stamp? Uh, here we have the estate sales stamp for uh, Delacroix. And on the right, we have um, just a blow up of uh, Renoir's initial on a wash in watercolor drawing. Here are different types of uh, signatory stamps, uh, essaying marks for silver and different stamps on a 19th century piece of ceramic. The reverse of painting and labels, be it customs label, 
exhibition labels, uh, gallery labels, inscriptions, or is something that we also investigate uh, because what is in the back or in the base of an object might be more telling than what is in the front. Furniture joinery and labels and inscriptions, also on furniture and works of art. Um, for example, this uh, dovetailing in this uh, 18th century library table is very unusual. So we will discuss the different types of joinery, what they mean, and how to actually understand how the object is made and marketed, be it via a Marchand Mercier, the ancestors to the interior designers or dealers. And here we also have uh, on the right, a label of a Caribbean Haitian piece of furniture. And this is another category that we are investigating right now is all of the, the West Indies and Caribbean contribution to the conversation in decorative arts, which has been an underrepresented categories for uh, centuries. So art markets, what I'm showing you here is actually a banknote uh, composition uh, for the 19th century, but that was, would illustrate very well uh, the art market and the mechanics of the auction sale. So uh, what happens in an auction? How, what, bring, what, what is being consigned to the auction and how is it picked? to be um, uh, shown in a, a category of an auction. Uh, so there's two different types of auctions. There's the, the live auction and, and more so now the online auctions. Um, why, where is the inventory for the auction? Well, we always talk about the three Ds. I always talk about the four Ds. So uh, the stock comes from estates, so death, divorce, equitable distribution, unfortunately, damage also, uh, objects that have been damaged or that have been um, a compromise in some way, oftentimes end up um, at auction and debt. People in debt end up putting their objects uh, at auction. And also there are people that just need to deaccession. that would be the 50, deaccession from their collection. So we explain the trends, uh, the marketing that goes into selling of work of art. I'm showing you here the Salvador Mundi that was heavily restored and sold at uh, Christie's uh, for in excess of um, $450 million. And uh, the uh, Bansky uh, that was sold at Sotheby's in London that uh, self-destroyed uh, during the auction as the hammer was coming down and that sold for 1.4 million where the artist actually uh, said, I did not destroy the work of art, I actually created a new one. So all of these, uh, what I call the the participatory drivers are analyzed in the classroom. And why put an old master painting within a contemporary art sale sandwiched between uh, Vija Selmin and a uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat? We explain retrospective uh, sales, for example, uh, two images that look exactly the same. Uh, one, uh, November 2010, goes for $25,000 in January 2011 for 300,000. What is the difference? They're both by Handy World, they're both 1972, they're both edition of 250, but the one on the right that fetched 200,000 was actually shot with a gun by Dennis Hopper. So that becomes a collaborative work and the story, the narrative of this particular um, work of art actually gives it a plus, plus value. Uh, Underrepresented artists are now the latest trends. So uh, 2017, a Barclay Hendrix uh, picture goes for 900,000. Two years later, it goes for in excess of $3 million, almost $4 million. So what does that say about the market, about the scholarship that is necessary to unearth all of these um, underrepresented categories of art? Is it just a trend? Will it last? or is it just a moment in time? These are important questions. The same goes with um, a cause, for example, is all over the news. Uh, this um, uh, appropriation of an appropriation, uh, this the cause album that fetched in Hong Kong uh, in excess of, of 14 million uh, in 2019. And um, uh, those enormous sculptures of these uh, comic book types of uh, figures that go for um, close to $2 million. 
what is happening in the market? Is it uh, a return to uh, infantilizing uh, the works of art? Is that what contemporary art is all about? Uh, blowing up toys? And uh, is this the future of the art market? It could be. What about collectibles? That's a new category that is now overshadowed a lot of uh, traditional categories of works of art. Um, these are sneakers uh, that sold for uh, $560,000. Art licensing in merchandise, the idea of luxury. So buying and selling at auction is an act of luxury, but now luxury and fashion and auctions are colliding and creating new markets. So those are other questions that we uh, discuss in class. Market disruptors, uh, NTF, that's the last slide, uh, non-fungible tokens, um, that's the next frontier. <laughs> so we all have to, um, to adapt to these new trends and fashions in order to move forward. And I just wanted to end uh, with this uh, wonderful painting of uh, Charles Peel called The Artist in His Museum of 1822. Um, uh, Charles uh, Peel was the founder of two academies, uh, namely the Pennsylvania Academy of, of Art, uh, one of the nation's first museum. And uh, he had a vision. Um, here he is showing not just uh, specimens of natural history, but also portraits of uh, great Americans. And um, his statement is part philosophical, um, which is, um, what is the nature of education? Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie. That was really fantastic, extremely insightful. And I think um, everybody uh, who's listening already realizes the different discourses, you know, depending on, you know, what institution you work for and the different focuses. So uh, I'm really looking forward to a discussion afterwards. Um, next, I'd like to welcome our speaker, Darren Milligan, um, who is the acting director of the Smithsonian Institution's Center for Learning and Digital Access in Washington, DC. He specializes in strategy for educational impact through user-centered research and the development of tools and services for making online cultural and scientific heritage resources accessible and useful to educators and learners. Um, it's really fantastic. It's again, we are talking about um, museum education, but uh, really the strong focus is on digital learning, digital education, something we really um, all became to value very, very much during the pandemic. Personally, I've mainly worked with the um, VNA, um, Getty, and um, particularly the Heilbronn timeline of art at the Met. And, and then I discovered the uh, Smithsonian Learning Lab and thought it was extremely exciting. And um, um, this is why I invited Darren. So I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mimi, for the introduction as well. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, this afternoon, or I guess this evening for many of you, um, to uh, share a little bit of uh, the story about how the Smithsonian is using uh, collection digitization to empower educational outreach and really encourage uh, what we call deeper learning in support of teachers, uh, caregivers, and students. So I, I have my contact information there on the slide. So if, if um, we don't have um, time for um, uh, covering all the questions today, I welcome um, you to reach out to me and to continue the conversation. Um, I thought I'd start um, with a little bit about the Smithsonian itself. Um, oftentimes when talking to, um, uh, to colleagues outside of the United States or to families outside of the United States, this is often what uh, people know of the Smithsonian. Um, this is from the 2009 film, uh, Night at the Museum Battle of the Smithsonian. But I often you know, like to think more of this um, image and, and, and Mimi reminded me this morning, um, this is actually um, our house museum. This is the 1849 James Renwick Smithsonian Castle Building, uh, which houses, uh, currently houses the Smithsonian Administration on the National Mall in Washington, DC. Um, but this was originally also a house. Um, this housed the leadership of the Smithsonian and their families, as well as um, the first several generations of scientists and curators who worked um, under the umbrella of the Smithsonian in the 19th century, uh, when our institution was founded 175 years ago. Um, since then, we've grown um, to become the world's largest museum education and research complex, and um, the Smithsonian now um, uh, manages 19 museums in Washington, D.C. and New York City, as well as nine international research centers, libraries, archives, and, uh, and um, 
the National Zoo. Um, we're often known amongst scholarly audiences for our collections, which are quite diverse. Um, they cover iconic objects. Um, this is the Hope Diamond, uh, one of the world's largest deep blue diamonds. Um, uh, contemporary cultural objects. Um, this is a, the puffy shirt from the episode of Seinfeld, if you're familiar um, with that uh, television show from the 80s and 90s. Um, they cover art collections that um, Sorry, have become um, icons. Darren, sorry, hi. Yes. Uh, actually, I think your screen is frozen because we, your slides are not moving. Yeah, thank you. And it's not on presenters. Have you seen any of the slides? No, uh, they just moved and we see, uh, now it's to your cover, cover slide, your title slide. Okay, let me see here. But it's the is small, it changing? It's the smaller version, yeah. not the presenter's view. Not changing. Your slides okay, are changing let's... now, but when you click on presenter view, then when I go to full screen, okay. they don't change. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I see. Okay. I will um, just stay in this view, I think, which will be fine. Great. Um, um, let me go back here. That's um, working. Great. Here's the, the castle building I spoke in case you didn't see that earlier. That's our beautiful headquarters building. Um, uh, fine, I'll, I'll start again here, I think with um, um, uh, art objects that have really um, become um, in, in an educational perspective, um, icons of American history. So, you know, on the left is, um, is Gilbert Stewart's 1796 portrait of George Washington. And on uh, the right, uh, Gindy Wiley's portrait of President uh, Barack Obama. Um, our collections um, as well include um, contemporary works of art. Um, this is Electronic Superhighway, Continental US, Alaska, and Hawaii from 1995 by Nam June Pike at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Uh, the collections includes objects that document the complex history of the United States. Um, on the left here is, is a Lakota winter count that records events. Um, uh, taking place between years 1800 and 1870. Um, and on the right, um, a lunch counter from Woolworth store in Greensboro, North Carolina, that was used um, in the 1960 youth led movement to challenge racial inequality throughout the South. The collection includes objects that document um, 20th century technological achievements. On the left, uh, many people powered um, heavier than air flying machine. Um, and on the right, the space shuttle Discovery. Um, this is one of five space shuttles um, that were in use um, in the 20th century and into the 21st century. Um, this space shuttle was used um, for 27 years um, and had more uh, space flights than any other. A vast majority of the collection of the Smithsonian, however, is in the natural um, history space. Um, the Smithsonian has about 158 million objects in its collection, and about 90% of those are specimens. Um, here we see on the left entomology specimens, on the right uh, botany algal collections. These are what we consider um, dry collections, but we also have wet collections. These are fishes at the National Museum of Natural History on the left. Um, and on the right um, are um, uh, nitrogen-cooled uh, tanks that store the genetic information for uh, currently about 5 million species. And finally, what we call our living collections. Um, these are um, animals kept at our Conservation Biology Institute or at our National Zoo that are involved in captive breeding for uh, species conservation. So all of these objects are made available to, to researchers and to the public under the Smithsonian's mission statement, which is the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the Smithsonian is really an educational institution at our heart and, and teachers, um, specifically a group that I, I carry, uh, I care a lot about, um, partially for really personal reasons. Um, I love to show this photo. This is my grandfather um, in 1943 in his first year of teaching. Uh, he taught U.S. history in uh, public school in Pennsylvania, where I grew up and um, occupied that classroom for 30 years. Uh, when he retired, um, this guy literally took over that classroom. This is my father who also taught U.S. history. Um, here's, he's uh, demonstrating one of the uh, colonial stocks he had in, in his room. And, you know, when I think about um, what um, my grandfather's classroom was um, probably like, and really what I, I remember my father's classroom being like, I had him for, for several years as a high school student. Um, what I picture is not too different than this. Um, this is a photograph of a classroom in 1925 from the collection of the National Museum of American History. Um, the students here are having identical learning experiences. 
They're all reading from the same textbook at the same pace in a very highly structured and very non-personalized manner. And you know, the good news about education is that this style of education, which was developed largely in the 19th century, is, is changing very quickly. You know, this is much more um, uh, common of what a classroom might look like. And really, over the past year, um, classrooms have looked a lot like this in a sort of a blended learning environment in which students are engaged in much more self-directed, independent learning. Um, what we found at the center is that teachers are hungry for discovering the interdisciplinary connections between the subjects that they teach. And this is partially because um, existing uh, teaching standards, both here in the United States and, and, and around the world, really um, require that. But they also recognize that the, the connections to the way the world really works are inherent in these kinds of interdisciplinary discussions. Teachers are hungry for the kinds of conversations that we have at museums, and they're hungry for resources and the tools um, to make this happen for their students as well. So I'm going to talk this morning um, a little bit about a, a tool to help position the Smithsonian at the center of these conversations um, to the connections between the knowledge that we share and that we create here at the Smithsonian. Um, I want to start uh, back with an artwork that um, we sort of breezed past. Maybe you didn't see this earlier. Uh, hopefully you caught a glimpse of it. Um, uh, this is um, uh, a work of art called Electronic Superhighway. And I'm guessing that if you've been to Washington and visited the Smithsonian American Art Museum, um, you remember this piece. It's really a visitor favorite. Um, the work is by a Korean American artist um, named Namjoon Pike and shows how people across all of America are connected by media and by television. So uh, Pike came to the United States in the 1960s and was, influenced by the diversity of Americans and both how the technology influenced but also represented our culture and our lives. Um, he was a technologist, um, Pike made robots, um, really fascinated by technology of how technology um, enables the transfer of information and how it unifies um, a country as diverse as the United States. In the mid 1990s, he made this work um, you can sort of tell by the, the photograph here about the um, uh, dimensions of this, this space. Um, Let's see if these videos will play. Yes, good. Um, the work's made up of um, more than 300 televisions and neon tubes and videos within each of the individual states that are outlined by the um, uh, by the, the neon represent ideas or sometimes even stereotypes of Pike's view of, um, of, of America and Americans. Um, Pike was really fascinated by the enabling potential of technology um, that was really emerging in the 1990s. So the, the internet uh, is really what this, this work in a sense is about and ways that um, the internet was enabling new digital connections. And so um, actually, if you visit Washington DC, the part of the map that um, outlines um, the uh, um, the, the part of the map that's Washington DC is actually a closed circuit television. So you can become part of um, the, the work itself. Let's see if these videos will load. There we go. Um, Pike is credited with coining the phrase electronic superhighway to refer to telecommunications and ultimately to the internet itself. And, you know, this work resonates with um, so many visitors um, who are visiting from the United States for the obvious geographic you know, connections of finding where they're from and how it's represented, but also because of its sheer sort of electricity and power. So young and old really flock to this work um, at the museum, you know, and it turns out that it really resonates with students in classrooms too. So I want to take a pause before um, uh, moving on with, with the discussion to talk a little bit more about um, um, how we arrived at developing the Smithsonian Learning Lab and some of the questions that we began asking ourselves at the center. So the Center for Learning and Digital Access has existed for 30 years, and our focus is specifically on um, enabling learning um, by using our collections, typically outside of our museums or outside of Washington, D.C. or New York City, where our public um, uh, spaces are, are available. And about six years ago, we started rethinking how we um, serve uh, users online and started asking ourselves a series of questions. And the first one was really simple about how we could design a better website. Um, how could we make a website that's more usable for by, by teachers and, and by their students? And that led us, I think, to think about what our role as museum educators really is. And the traditional role, I think, of museum educators was to translate the, um, the exhibitions or the scholarship to um, a broader audience. So how can, how, can teacher, how can we help teachers explain our exhibitions to students? The more we started working with teachers and talking to teachers, that question began to evolve as we, as we looked inward, as we, as, we, as we had conversations externally. And that started um, us thinking about what is it that we are uniquely positioned, our collection 
is uniquely positioned um, to support with teachers and, and uh, learners. And that led us to ask a very different question, which is not how can we share our knowledge with teachers, but what really do teachers need from a place like us? What do teachers need from museums or research centers, libraries or archives? And that ultimately led to the final question that, that drove us and, and is still the question that um, uh, motivates us as, as we um, evolve the Smithsonian Learning Lab and, and continue to support online learning. And that's how can we help young people be successful in their lives? So I want to share with you a few, before formally introdu introducing the Learning Lab, I want to show you a few examples of things that teachers have done with our digital collections. Um, let me see if these videos will load. There we go. Okay. What you're seeing here is an interactive learning experience created by Amanda Risk. Amanda is a teacher, um, and she's not an art history teacher or a geography teacher, but Amanda teaches math. And she's using electronic superhighway um, really in ways that stretch beyond what the museum traditionally um, may use this object uh, for in terms of art history um, um, or American history. In the activity, Amanda challenges her students to understand the, the longevity of these, what you're seeing on the screen, these cathode ray tubes. This is the type of technology that uh, Pike used Used, um, in the televisions that make up the work. So her students apply principles of mathematics to understand the potential lifespan of this work of art, which is actually something that the, the um, conservation staff at um, the Smithsonian American Art Museum is, is challenged with um, 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 in, in, in the sense of the real world. This next example is again, not by an art teacher, uh, but this time by an English teacher, Yolanda Tony. And Yolanda teaches English outside of Chicago. And she, uh, in, in a way of introducing the novel called The Westing Game, um, she challenges her students as they work through the novel to compare the written work, um, how the book's author describes America, and then how Pike does in this artwork. So she integrated um, resources from, as you see here on the screen, Khan Academy, Wikipedia, the Chicago Tribune, um, in the Smithsonian Learning Lab, um, and, um, and creates a writing activity in which students imagine themselves transported to one of the states um, as if it were represented by Pike's perspective. And these are just two examples of the ways that teachers have used one incredible artwork in, in novel ways. Um, on the next screen here, I have a couple uh, more examples on the left here. This is a lesson on bi biography that uses artworks by a, a wide variety of Asian Pacific American artists. And on the right, um, another video. Um, made by a teacher who works with very young students. So um, she's using this artwork along with stamps and artifacts and other Smithsonian objects um, to introduce the concept of electricity to preschoolers. And you know what makes these tools, what makes these experiences possible is a tool called the Smithsonian Learning Lab. And I'd, I'd invite you um, to visit learninglab.si.edu um, to create a free account and to explore some of these experiences as well. Um, the uh, Learning Lab was created by the Center for Learning and Digital Access in 2016. And you know these few examples of these Learning Lab collections, these learning experiences that we've made are just a few of more than 40,000 um, learning experiences that um, teachers across the world have made since our launch. We spent um, three years in really active research and evaluation um, to understand how teachers and, and their students um, use digital content in teaching and learning. We really hope to achieve two things with the Learning Lab. The first was to understand what teachers are doing in their classrooms. I mean, many of the things that people are doing on the Learning Lab now, they were doing in the past, but they were invisible to us. But, but having our own platform, we can understand how they use our materials. Um, secondly, and perhaps more importantly, we wanted teachers to think of the Smithsonian of museums as more than just an event, more than just a field trip, but rather a rich resource, a place where they could see all the Smithsonian, a place where they, those interdisciplinary connections could emerge to create a platform where they could learn um, from our own educators and really from each other. So I'm gonna take you on the last remaining minute or two here, I'm gonna take you on a real whirlwind tour of, of uh, what's possible in the Learning Lab and then, uh, invite you to, to continue exploring it, it yourself. So um, the Smithsonian uh, Learning Lab is a very visual place. So searching for a, a bug pulls up incredible, uh, beautiful high resolution images uh, from across our collection. I mean, I this is the sort of image I always think about when, a, when an insect is, is buzzing me, and I'm annoyed that they're actually these incredibly beautiful um, uh, animals. Um, beyond a discovery engine for currently about 6 million digitized objects from the Smithsonian, the set of tools encourages its users to aggregate those resources together, to upload material from their own life or from other digital sources, and to create digital learning opportunities for their students. So this is another collection like the others that we saw from, um, uh, from, from Yolanda and Amanda. 
This one is about um, the history of the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States and, and how it represents um, 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 aspects of, of our, our troubled history. Um, you can see here on one of the resources within this collection, um, Kate Harris, who's the author of this collection, used the tools of the lab to, to highlight sections of objects, to annotate those, to transcribe text, and to build assessments directly into her learning experiences, all using the tools of the learning lab. Ultimately, we really um, um, are hoping to build a community of online learning. So amongst um, those 40,000 collections that are available to other users, you can copy other users' collections and adapt them. So this is a collection about the impacts of the Civil War on uh, President Abraham Lincoln. Um, using the tools of the lab again, I could copy this and make my own version. If you can see there, this went from Abraham Lincoln, the face of war, to Darren's Abraham Lincoln, and I've added some new resources um, into this. So I wanted people who were seeing my collection to be able to explore the 3D versions of these uh, life masks of Abraham Lincoln, um, as well as um, have the information to download and uh, print, uh, print these on their own. So all of these tools are uh, open to other museums as well. So there are hundreds of non-Smithsonian museums and other cultural heritage organizations around the world that are using these tools to highlight their own collections and to bring to light connections and correlations with the collection of the Smithsonian. Um, this is really a tool that's unfinished. Uh, we're really just at the first chapter of understanding what our users do with these tools and the resources to personalize uh, learning. So I invite you following uh, today's uh, conversation to, um, to visit the Learning Lab and to, to join in on that. So thank you again for having me today. That was a fantastic uh, tour de force through the Smithsonian Learning Lab. It's really amazing. And I think it's totally different from all the other sources uh, that, that we would normally use, where we kind of use it, uh, we copy it. But here we can actually create, we can work with, with, with the collection. It's an amazing resource. So uh, thank you so much. And um, I'm looking forward to our uh, discussion uh, later. Thank you. Um, I would now like to ask um, Oliver Cox, who is um, from the Oxford University Heritage network and I've um, known Oxford, uh, I've known Oliver now for a few years and he was just starting it out when we first met and it has grown so much I mean it's really fantastic what you have done and how you engage with so many different stakeholders and communities so it's really an inspiration Oliver thank you very much for being here today Thank you very much indeed, Mimi, and um, thank you to the colleagues who have presented so far. Really fascinating stuff, so hopefully I can contribute in some uh, small way to our discussion today. Um, well, it's very nice to be coming to you live from South London, um, uh, and in particular the London Borough of Lambeth, where I haven't left for about six months. I'm desperate, desperate to leave my spare room to actually visit the historic house. It's a year to the day since my last visit to stow landscape gardens on the outskirts um, of, um, uh, uh, of Oxford. So what I want to do in my 15 minutes today is reflect on the current position of historic houses in the UK and then share some thoughts as to why I think collaboration with universities is so vital for historic houses that open to the public. And I'll end my presentation by sharing a few examples of projects up and down the country that give you a sense of what's possible when universities and historic houses find that sweet spot for collaborating. So hopefully you can all see my slides moving along. Um, let me take you right back to the heady days of 2019. The UK's historic house sector was in rude health. Indeed, it was the most popular year ever in terms of visitors, um, in terms of visitors to historic houses across Britain. In 2019, 26.8 million people visited the 1,500 member houses of historic houses. And that's the body that represents those houses still in private ownership, um, uh, which is more than the total number of international visitors to Japan. The National Trust welcomed over 28 million people to its pay for entry sites. And since the year 2000, its membership has grown by 120% from 2.7 million to 5.95 million people. And it's worth recalling that that is more than the membership, the combined membership of every single political party in the UK combined. 
And thinking about the roots of this massive growth, one aspect is the significant infrastructure investment made by heritage organizations into what I like to call the holy trinity of heritage. That's toilets, car parks, and cafes, which ensure a baseline quality to any visit. But this investment in the Holy Trinity has been paralleled by com comparable investment in exciting and engaging programming and the significant repositioning of the historic house as a family visitor attraction. So this means that with over 50 million visits to historic houses a year in the UK, these spaces and places are of huge significance in sharing Britain's history with both domestic and global audiences. Well, then 2020 happened. Um, and I don't, you know, <laughs> need to share with you all the fact that 2020 was the worst year for the museum and cultural heritage sector since the Second World War. Lockdown and other COVID restrictions significantly impacted upon historic houses' ability to open. Interiors not suitable to social distancing, unlike some museums, due to the dense furnishings and inability to allow free flow. Volunteers drawn from an age group that are most at risk from the virus had a disastrous impact on organizations' finances. The National Trust, the largest single operator of historic houses in the UK, will lose and has predicted to lose in the region of £200 million last year. Now, some of this financial impact has been mitigated through the UK government's cultural recovery fund. And interestingly, taxpayers' money has been made available to private owners. Blenheim Palace, for example, received £1.8 million to help fund a major new feature within the historic stables and provide a, his, a fully accessible route to the formal gardens for the first time. So if there was the financial threat, the second aspect for heritage organisations opening country houses to the public was the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the reanimation of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is brought to the fore both in terms of organizational strategies and press attention, activities concerned with active decolonization of collections and inherited historical narratives. In particular, this activity has and will continue to focus on the need to make visible change in the way in which collection items associated with the histories of enslavement and colonialism are interpreted. And this is an opportunity made more difficult by the financial apocalypse of 2020 and the likely slow revival of domestic and international tourism. The financial, these financial implications, I would suggest, are of grave significance for public history. Organizations forced to cut project costs and curatorial budgets will need to prioritize those projects that have the potential for direct commercial return, which in the current environment might put a worlding of the British historic house somewhat towards the back of the queue. But despite all of this, I want to remain optimistic. So here are a couple of the um, the recent um, uh, recent bits of um, sort of political discussion about the country house. I want to remain optimistic because I do think it remains a hugely exciting time for university and historic house collaborations. Partnerships can be of all different scales and sizes, from individual students choosing to volunteer with particular organisations through to multi-year funded formal collaborations with multiple academics and researchers. And it's important to stress at the outset that these collaborations are not just about historical research. What's so striking about the opportunity with historic houses is just how broad the range of topics it is possible to explore are. Um, and I just want to give you three examples of current projects that we're working on in Oxford. Colleagues of mine at the Oxford Robotics Institute are testing their driverless cars in the wider estate at Blenheim Palace. 
Now, I'm no scientist, but from what I could understand, the cars were very good at going in a straight line, but not so good at dealing with curves and undulations. So it turns out that a capability to uh, brown designed landscape is a pretty ideal test ground. Secondly, colleagues at the Oxford Resilient Buildings Laboratory are developing a new lime mortar toolkit for historical buildings and historic buildings with the aim of reducing repair costs and increasing the effectiveness of lime mortar. And at Chatsworth House in Derbyshire, we've developed a multi-year partnership to provide paid internships for Oxford students to spend the summer with the collections team at Chatsworth, um, creating both new um, academic articles, but also thinking really carefully about the ways in which that new research is uh, translated and transmitted to a whole range of different audiences. Now, how are these projects funded? The first of these, is part of a major multi-million pound research project funded by the Department of Transport in the UK. The second is supported by Government Research Council investment in heritage science. And the third is funded by the university. I do think that despite the, the flowering of research activity, there remain substantial challenges in how new historical information might be both accessed and interpreted within the historic house context. Relevant research in scholarly journals often sits behind a paywall, making it inaccessible to staff and volunteers at historic houses who cannot justify the subscription fees. So I commend to you in this respect, the Paul Mellon Center's recently launched Art and the Country House Project, which is an example of what is possible through open access online publication. So there are some fantastic, um, you know, richly peer reviewed um, and detailed scholarly essays. Um, I've written a couple, so do read them, oh, they're great. But no, really read other colleagues' uh, uh, contributions, which are far more erudite uh, and engaging than mine. Um, so what I think links together these three projects and the fourth, which I've just shared with you here, um, is a commitment to a set of three core values that underpin all of our collaborative work in the University of Oxford. Knowledge, credibility, and inventiveness. So what our researchers do is bring a deep knowledge of the subject to a project. This in turn gives the outcomes an enormous amount of credibility. The two provide the foundation for us to be inventive in the way in which we work with our partners. This is as true for historians as it is for computer scientists, as it is for ecologists. And the feedback loop depends on the quality of the content. What we aim for is something I call triple A content. That's content that's accurate, authentic, and most importantly of all, accessible. So what we look to do um, through collaboration at the University of Oxford is unlock stories. We're experts, we're, we're innovators, but most importantly, we're partners. We want to celebrate the connections between our people, our, part of, our partners, and the collections that they hold. So in the final part of my talk, I just want to take things back to basics for a minute and consider some of the reasons why universities might be interested in working with historic houses. It's important in that case to remember the core purpose of universities. We exist to advance the world's knowledge and communicate these findings to as wide a range of audiences as possible. As such, the historic house is a treasure trove of research opportunities. It provides the historian with bundles of manuscripts, the environmental scientist with a rich landscape full of data, and the social scientist with all sorts of different people to research. Most excitingly, the historic house is a setting where it is possible to connect ideas to place. I believe that it is the place and setting that has the potential to bring relevance and meaning to abstract concepts. And you know, ultimately, universities want to support research into the big ideas behind special places. Secondly, the historic house community is full of expertise. For universities, 
there's an enormous incentive to work with expertise that exists outside the higher education sector. A two-way exchange of knowledge makes the end product richer, more reliable, and more resilient. The experience of heritage practitioners, curators, conservators, historic house owners, and managers can create an important dialogue with heritage education, with higher education, helping to broaden and inform the views of academics and students. Thirdly, we want to produce engaging and most importantly, employable students. Working with historic houses not only gives students an important dose of the real world, it also sharpens up their skills in a whole variety of different areas. As a consequence, universities invest heavily in student placements, internships, and training programs. Um, so, you know, I, and, and as Mimi has done, I'd suggest to reach out to those departments and work with them to develop projects. It's fantastic that a number of uh, Oxford University micro interns are supporting uh, this week's activities. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we want to engage wider non-specialist audiences with our research. One of the most important determinants of the amount of funding that universities receive in the UK is something called impact. Publicly funded research is required to have social, cultural and economic benefit. And it's my firm belief that the best way to achieve that is to work in partnership. So the key to successful partnership is mutual benefit. And in order to develop and identify these areas of mutual benefit, I think that takes time. Don't rush it. Explore the, each other's aims, ambitions, and motivations. This is the part of the collaboration that takes the most time. It's important to build trust, but also crucially to develop a shared language. So with that in mind, I'd say that working with a university is not necessarily a quick fix solution. We're complicated, slow moving, lumbering beasts. We work on different time scales to most commercial organizations and have very long lead in times for projects. So my advice is to start the conversation as early as possible. And I wanted to conclude by just sharing a couple of um, current projects that we're uh, embarking on and have embarked upon um, at the university over the past few years using a type of funding that's available in the UK called a collaborative doctoral award. These are scholarships that pay for a research, that, that pay a researcher an annual salary to complete a PhD in partnership with an organization outside of academia. Um, and my team in Oxford has a great track record of creating these opportunities, but they do take a long period of time to gestate. So here's one we're now two and a half years into, which is a, um, a history of the Historic Houses Association, exploring all of the, the significant uh, role that taxation uh, reform plays in the preservation of um, historic houses from 1950 to the present day. And then more broadly, our, our, our work around historic houses at the moment has is focusing you know, very much on the broader global histories and global resonances of these places. So we have a project on West Indian absentee slaveholding. Um, we've got well, an anthropology um, project on photographs of empire in country house collections. Um, and we're in the process of recruiting for a PhD exploring class, art, and the influences of British India at Bateman's, Roger Kipling's family home. So, I hope that whistle stop tour has given you a sense of the what is possible through collaboration with universities. And one area where I feel universities can be especially helpful for historic houses is to act as a critical friend. In the past few years of working with privately owned properties in the UK, I've noticed a reticence or indeed a fear of opening up archives or of showing paintings and, and, and objects to academic researchers. This is especially true when it comes to questions regarding the origins of wealth. There is, I would argue, fantastic challenging research that increasingly links country houses to imperial wealth, including slavery. So what I tried to say to owners of such properties 
worried about these links is that you have to own them now. You have to get ahead of the narrative and work with partners to explore and explain those histories. Most importantly, I feel we need to be honest and open in sharing the full history of these homes. And I'd like to think that organisations that commit to that will gain respect in return. Thanks ever so much for your time uh, this evening, this morning and this afternoon. Absolutely fascinating, Oliver. Thank you so much. I'd love to start the conversation right away because the Indian context, of course, is, is very different. And we also have a history of slavery, not necessarily of African slavery, but um, you know, enslaved labor in India. And there's also the idea of um, auspiciousness. So if you want to, um, if you are the owner, your conversation might be very different from an academic conversation. Because if you are an owner and you depend on weddings, and there's a history of you know, slavery or, or you know, abuse associated with the building, you are never going to do any wedding there because of this Indian concept of auspiciousness. So there are many different kinds of challenges in the, in the Indian context, for example. But uh, we'll, we'll discuss that later. Thank you so much. And one thing I wanted to mention that really, really intrigued me also, Oliver, before our um, event, uh, when you actually mentioned that you were heading to India virtually, and I thought it was really, really lovely because we have all of these webinars with people from all over the world and we don't, we don't remember anymore, we don't think about the place. And this is the first time that someone actually brought up the place and I think it's, uh, it's really lovely we that we have this kind of knowledge of you know, being in India at the moment, having partners from the US, from England and being here together to discuss this. So thank you very much, Oliver. <laughs> so now comes our last speaker and um, I told you that the whole idea about the Center for Historic Houses of India is also to build bridges and um, maybe some of the um, well, discussions or discourses concerning historic houses are not so well known um, in um, abroad. Maybe Asian studies, but what we do is not only uh, restricted to Asian studies, but it's also re uh, re related to the larger questions of heritage, historic houses, and so on. So I'm really, really pleased uh, to have a colleague from the University of Amdabad, um, um, Neil, who is an, uh, Neil Chapagain, who is the director of the Center for Heritage Management at Amdabad University. Um, he's also um, developing and is teaching for UNESCO and he will uh, talk a little bit about uh, the center and his ideas. So it's really wonderful to have the Indian perspective now as well. Welcome, Neil. Thank you, Esther. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's really wonderful uh, opportunity to have this opportunity to share with you uh, what we are doing at Ahmedabad University. Um, it's about a very young program. Um, do you hear me well? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I'll share my screen and let me just turn on my reminder if in case I exceed. Um, so um, by the way, I'm, I'm actually speaking to you from Nepal, my home country. Uh, I'm at home since the pandemic. Uh, so, but it's wonderful to be able to use the technology to uh, sort of, uh, you know, cross the boundaries and, and be with all of you today. So I wanted to share my bit in terms of an experiment that we have started at Ahmedabad University. Uh, when the university set up a center for heritage management, um, the idea was to think about heritage idea, uh, what it means for countries like India uh, and, uh, and what can it uh, bring to the, the young generation, that was the idea. So when we thought about uh, starting a master's program, well, we did a pilot uh, courses at the undergraduate level, but we really settled down at the master's level. Um, if I would connect this to today's conversation, we're talking about historic houses. The way we would approach in our program is we'll then sort of uh, zoom out and look at where is historic house situated. And it, it is, uh, you know, a, a built heritage if you want to connect to the heritage world. Uh, and uh, when we look at the built heritage, it's not just a building, it's the site, it's the ambience, it's the, the landscape, it's the environment, it's the people. And then so uh, when you start looking at the broader picture, uh, this is where you reach to uh, heritage management. So this is how we conceptualize, this is our mental mapping 
of the program. So if I think of built heritage management, then um, at least these four layers I can think of that you see on the slide, that it's not just about physical structure and fabric, which is also very important, but it is also about those non-physical, non-touchable things, which are the different layers and values from historic to cultural, to even contemporary aesthetics and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but then there are also very important contemporary contexts and possibilities. This is where the innovation comes, collaboration comes, uh, economics and, and so many other disciplines come. And, and perhaps uh, bridging it all together, maybe uh, what management means in our program is that it's looking at all those enabling systems and processes and the resources that one needs. Uh, and, and so for us, uh, this, this, is the, this was the idea of heritage management program that we thought when we started. So the center was established in 2011. I joined in 2013 uh, and I was the first faculty to be hired uh, in the center. Um, and, and further zooming out, the built heritage becomes part of an urban heritage and urban doesn't necessarily mean the cities, it's basically where people are. Uh, but then really this uh, sort of reveals the interconnections with other layers, uh, the natural and the cultural landscapes, uh, the, you know, in the other scale, it's about the objects and collections, but also about intangibles. And when you see the interlinkages between these different themes that might go under the umbrella of heritage, you start seeing different things that one needs to learn, like previous speakers also highlighted, you know, the pedagogy and the different thematic learning areas. We also mapped out different areas that one has to uh, perhaps consider uh, studying at a graduate level. So what do we do? What kind of program do we want to do? Uh, we didn't want to re repeat another architectural conservation program. By the way, my background uh, is architecture and uh, many of us in, in, uh, in Nepal, in India, in South Asia, in fact, uh, who work in heritage sector, I think come from architecture background. So very consciously, we also wanted to go beyond that architectural uh, domain and be inclusive as well. Um, we were not very aware at that point in time uh, when we launched the program in 2015, but coincidentally, it also happened that the sustainable development goals had been uh, sort of articulated by 2015. And this initiative called Education for Sustainable Development was also uh, evolving at the United Nations level, particularly UNESCO was championing it. Later on, I came across several literature where I really noticed uh, some resonance uh, with what we we're also thinking uh, that uh, this particular uh, literature suggested that the ESD uh, looks for education that is transforming, uh, that reorients, and that also aims at formation of values, skills, attitudes, and behaviors. So this really resonates to what we also were aiming when you were designing the master's program, that it needs to be impactful to the young mind. It needs to reorient them uh, into thinking about future and the possibilities, but it should do, do that by you know, inculcating certain values and skills and knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, and so you know, things of that nature. So really after two years of working on designing the program, when we launched the program in 2015, uh, this really, I feel good about this example that uh, the guest of honor was uh, not a government secretariat because that uh, the ministers were suggested, the secretaries were suggested, but we really settled down by inviting a craftsperson from a, a part of Gujarat, the state where we uh, are located, uh, the Smile by Khatri, who is a school dropout, a master artisan, uh, but who also later on was given an honorary doctorate uh, by De Montfort University in UK because of the sheer volume of his contribution to many researchers. So we found a wonderful person who connected to the, the ground realities, who was a, a craftsperson himself, his entire family, generations were there. In fact, his village, uh, Ajrakpur, uh, is a constant learning site in our program. And we're lucky that he agreed to be our guest of honor. And this is how we started our journey. Um, we had a major aim that we wanted to prepare heritage professionals who pursue heritage in a broader sense, and then who uh, strive to practice an integrated idea of heritage, uh, bringing in the management perspective, because Ahmedabad is also known for management education. So this was the context we we're connecting to. And then we sort of uh, articulated a few objectives that the program was uh, should be aiming for. Uh, and then we further detailed out, uh, I'm not going into detail here, but particularly in the academic sense, it, it was trying to connect to the knowledge, skills and attitude uh, <clears throat> kind of a formula. Uh, and then we sort of visualized uh, our own overall structure of the program that it should start with an inaugural seminar where 
every incoming students would present who they are, where they come from, what is their heritage thinking uh, and all that. So it became an opportunity for us to really engage in a conversation uh, where I think at the end of it, the, the point was to uh, sometimes unlearn what we had previously learned and sometimes also to see the opportunities of peer learning and, and really set up the goals for the next two years. Uh, and in the formal program in the first semester, we'd have some basic courses, uh, then followed by the field immersion, which is really going back to the field um, in, a, in a community setting, then come back and tease out certain professional courses on heritage management, and then again, go back to the field, but this time more organized through organizations um, in terms of internship, which we call practicum, also followed by research, and then come back and then start your specialization, which is more individual track of studies. Uh, and in between, we also ask the students to demonstrate <clears throat> that they are fulfilling certain social responsibilities. Uh, and then eventually they will complete a thesis uh, while they also pursue a course in ethics and, and professional practice. So my courses really are at the very beginning at the end, which is the heritage discourses at the beginning and the ethics and professional practice at the end. And in between, I fill in for many other courses, uh, but this is how. And then we also encourage our students to really reach out to international audience by participating in conferences, which we call it the Capstone Conference. In terms of pedagogy, we decided that there are four stakeholders here, participants, which are the students, the communities, which means uh, people like Ismail Bai Khatri, who might be the real practitioners in the field, but there might also be a counterpart, which are called the professionals. Uh, and so we distinguish between these two communities. And then there are these participants, the students and the faculty. And so really the pedagogy revolve around the, the multi-layered relationships uh, between among these, uh, these uh, stakeholders. And, uh, and these interactions uh, gave different kinds of uh, learning opportunity. And we made sure that each of these components that the four you see are in, in, embraced in the program uh, structure uh, and through courses. Uh, and really as a pedagogy, obviously being a formal academic center, we have a classroom learning, but really our emphasis was on the field-based learning. This has changed in the past year because of the pandemic. And I think that has given us tremendous opportunity of learning new ways of you know, connecting back to the field and really doing a lot of interesting things. So as a program, what we're hoping is that on the one hand, we want to encourage the critical heritage thinking. Um, and there are a set of courses that we have put in for that. Uh, we also build in, uh, want to build in uh, a managerial acumen. And this is particularly uh, in partnership with our management school, but also the School of Engineering and Arts and Sciences. And then uh, the third part is to work with the industry stakeholders, the communities, and develop professional development. And the fourth part is really each student uh, have their own specialization because they come from different backgrounds. Our program, I think one of the uh, groundbreaking thing our program did in India was to dissolve these disciplinary silos. The program is open to any discipline, uh, students coming from any discipline. You know, So I think these are some of the bold steps we had taken, which is by now in the fifth or sixth years of the program, it's been now uh, well appreciated. Um, and this is how it looked when we started. The, the kind of class that, that we were able to bring together. It's a small class, uh, 10 to 15 students every year, but really the diversity is what makes uh, the, the journey really exciting for, for them, but also for the faculty. And what you see in this picture, this is my one of the favorite where uh, I took this picture in one of my first classes where the two people you see in the right corner at the far end are other faculty colleagues. Uh, and really the, the center is the students and they are in it. So, so the, the pedagogy is, is what is reflected in this picture. And typically this format we follow uh, still now. And, and we're trying to uh, include more technology. We're trying to um, learn from different communities every year. Um, uh, earlier you were talking about uh, House Honor. In fact, uh, we were lucky to have uh, one of the princes also join as a student because she had a palace to manage. So she thought this is the best way to do it. Last year, we took the, you know, last year's first year students to her palace to do a study. And so I think the, the opportunities are endless uh, in, in a very different uh, ways than a typical academic program. Um, I don't have time to go through um, all the journey details, all the courses, but what I would like to share is a few uh, thesis topics because thesis really becomes uh, an, an outcome at the end for each individual student. Uh, since they come from different backgrounds, uh, that is reflected in their thesis also. So what happens is uh, the two years journey, uh, while on the one hand it's collaborative, it's shared journey, but it's also very unique, very personalized journey. 
Uh, and this is what uh, is possible when you have a small program, you know, it's very one-on-one -on -one, uh, sort of uh, mode of teaching and learning. Uh, so here are some of the examples of the thesis kinds of thesis that the students have taken up, where some of these are very technical, some of these are going back to economics, through communities, uh, and looking at uh, several other things from the local perspectives to the global discourses. Um, uh, I think this has been wonderful. Um, and many of the students actually, this is my warning, 12 minutes past, uh, so I have three minutes. Uh, and many of the students have pursued their thesis beyond just the graduate program and have um, aimed to make it uh, as, their, as their career goal. Um, they are in the market, uh, switching jobs from here to there. Uh, but I think the wonderful thing is how they're evolving. And since it's been just a few years, it's too early to say, but looking at uh, their uh, struggle in the field, their, their uh, passion and how they are following up, uh, I think it is uh, also becoming a lifelong learning and they're all connected to us. So the, the alumni strength is another thing that is driving to us. Uh, so I think it's been a wonderful journey that uh, we have started in India. There has been some good impacts to other universities also in terms of collaboration, but also in terms of uh, a new, uh, you know, some new programs that are coming up in India that, that we know. Um, recently, beyond India, we had the opportunity to work with UNESCO, particularly the UNESCO Asia Pacific Regional Office in Bangkok. Uh, and since last two years, we had uh, worked with UNESCO on this competency framework for cultural heritage management, uh, which uh, is really a wonderful process, which is trying to bring in the competence-driven education in the heritage sector. And, and uh, that is also connected to a set of academic learning outcomes that we collaboratively drafted. Now we are in a process to sort of map our program against this competence framework and see where are our gaps and, and all that. But this is also very important for me to point out that uh, this is not just done, done by UNESCO. In fact, the UNESCO Bangkok office is also promoting two very important university networks in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, one is the SN Academy for Heritage Management, AHM, which is uh, an old network, but which focuses mostly on the sites, uh, heritage management, world heritage sites. And then the new one, which was established two years back, called SA Pacific Higher Education Network for Intangible Cultural Heritage, uh, which is uh, typically following the 2003 Convention on Intangible Cultural Heritage, but it's, uh, it's broad. What is unique there is uh, our center is a board member in both of these uh, institutes, both of these associations. Uh, and so I think we are in a very unique position today in the SA Pacific region to really bridge the gap between the tangible and the intangible, the rural and the urban, nature and the culture. You know? so, so I think our program uh, the way it has tried to open up the heritage discourses, I think are reflected in these collaborative practices that we do with several other universities as well. And what Mimi mentioned in, the, in my introduction, uh, we are currently doing a course for UNESCO uh, based on this competence framework. This is a pilot course that we're, we're not just almost about to finish uh, this first pilot here. Um, so I think it's, it's an ongoing journey. I think we had, had a very uh, interesting start. Um, and uh, I think I would stop here um, and I, would, uh, I, I can resonate with uh, the previous speakers than the way you talked about pedagogies and the need of collaboration uh, and how the university needs to really work with the setting, the cities, the communities. I think these are in our ethos as well. And uh, I think uh, this uh, series of webinars might also be an opportunity for us to reach out to each other and find out uh, what we do. Uh, when the pandemic is over and we are back to some kind of a normal, we'll be also getting back to our regular series of international conferences, uh, which has been put on hold since the pandemic. We also have a journal of heritage management as a way to sort of encourage this kind of uh, interdisciplinary thinking around heritage that we wanted to promote. Uh, so we're doing a, a number of things to sort of bring this uh, new way of thinking about heritage in India. And I think we have been partly successful. It's, it's an ongoing journey. So thank you very much. I look forward to any questions and uh, look forward to talking to all of you. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Neil, for sharing the Indian perspective. I'm really curious to see how the students will develop, what they'll end up doing, whether they'll stay in India or take international posts and um, how this all will um, work out. Um, I'd be really interested in also collaborating and um, you know, um, doing some um, common projects together. Great. Now let us address um, some of the questions. And um, please, you know, it's, this, it's a rather small group. You can also unmute yourself and ask a question. I know that some students also might be um, more comfortable with using the chat box. Uh, let me just find, so we've had the question for, for Darren, yes. Um, 
um, that's something I wanted to say. It is an amazing resource, but it takes some time to get used to it. And I um, see this a lot with my students who are still not utilizing the internet um, in the most powerful way. They just Google, but Google is not research. And so they end up sometimes with kind of really weird um, examples, like in one case, they wanted um, to illustrate um, the image of an 18th century uh, French cabinet maker. And the image I saw was Frederick the Great. You know, that's the kind of thing that happens if you just Google the information. So, um, you know, all of these uh, resources require to work with them and to get used to them, and particularly for the uh, Smithsonian Heritage Lab. But the, the, the possibilities are amazing. And as I said, very, very different from, uh, you know, the other, um, resources and digitization that just you know digitize and offer it and share it that's not what you do that's that's really different what you do but what do you do with the kind of uh, especially you work with schools and you know I, I was amazed to see these examples from from uh, teachers it's really fantastic it shows how eager they are to work with the collections and to utilize them for the classroom but what are your solutions to make it easier you know Khan Academy is a fantastic resource it's really easy to use but you don't create you really allow for some creative engagement with the material but uh, do you offer workshops uh, for teachers or what are the, your strategies to kind of um, yeah, compensate for the different audiences and not every, everyone being you know so fit with technology yeah well th thank you for the question and it's a big concern of course you know it, it has been since we designed the the interface and we're, we're working with teachers of of all types to really understand those who you know, were very comfortable or very confident in using technology especially but especially those who who weren't and we've we've found you know since our launch and, and various uh, evaluations that we've done you know that that um connection with even a light touch of professional development um, has a dramatic impact in the depth of usage of, of you know tools any really education technology tools but you know in, in our case with um, adapting and, and creating in that space um, so we do offer um, a, a sort of a three-tiered uh, bi-weekly schedule of online um, sessions that um, go sort of span between using the tool, so very much about tool usage, but really um, on the other end of that spectrum about using digital museum resources in education, so much more from the sort of pedagogical perspective than the technical perspective. Um, and that that's um, a big a big part of kind of the role of the team, you know, at at the center and what they do. Um, another part of that is thinking more broadly about who our users are. And so, as we were designing the learning lab experience, we worked primarily with primary and secondary classroom instructors, um, classroom teachers, and we found that the sort of educational community, the educational ecosystem, is is much broader. And people who are in roles such as school librarians or curriculum designers and curriculum developers actually are much in a sense, many times better positioned to be the creators in a space like the learning lab, because that's really what what they do. And they're a lot more comfortable with using um, um, academic databases and, and, and searching in space like that. But it's really an ongoing struggle because you're exactly to your point. Um, people have become used to the user experience of Google and, you know, the, the search experience that we all um, I imagine I'll take advantage of and Google um, is the result of billions of dollars of investment in, in making that work as well as it does, even when it doesn't work that that specifically and museums certainly will never be able to compete with that and what we're you know, we're limited to um, the quality in the sense of the metadata that describes the objects in our collection and which is, you know, oftentimes centuries old or has been, you know, worked on throughout throughout the course of, of um, many, many um, generations of, of experts. And so um, part of what we deal with is that also working with digitization and working with the museums who have the, the curatorial expertise to think more broadly about who the end user of those metadata records, those collection records are, that they aren't they aren't specifically for um, or exclusively for other um, experts, um, but they could potentially be usable by teachers and students, enthusiasts by, by anyone. So, um, but it is a, a certainly an ongoing challenge with any sort of technology. So thank you for that question. Now, digitization is something that is strongly supported by the Indian government. We now have a very exciting portal for um, many of the Indian museums. And, but unfortunately, it's usually just a digitized object and maybe a description, but that's it. It's not like the Heilbrunn timeline or so where you have, you know, 
connection with essays and so on. And so what happens is if you Google um, a particular search term, these uh, objects will not turn up. So we are currently being, the Center for Historic Houses being supported by JP Morgan uh, Chase for a project, Tech for Social Good. And we are developing some digital tools, so I'd really love to follow up on this. And we are trying to uh, combine the digitized uh, objects from various big museums as far as Asian art is concerned. Uh, send is something like this supported by museums to combine, let's say, MET, Getty, v &A, and the Indian museums um, under one search platform because they are openly accessible? Or um, is this something you think that might not be discouraged, uh, that might be not be uh, encouraged because uh, how, how, do you, how do you feel about these combined kind of um, combining the uh, various uh, uh, digital archives under one platform? I mean, I think certainly from a user perspective, there's, there's probably an argument to be made for that. And, and there are examples of that, um, Europeana in, in Europe, um, in the United States, yes. the Digital Public Library of America does some of that aggregation work for American museums and libraries. Um, and there are a, a few other examples. I think the, the probably global example of that is probably Google Arts and Culture, um, which is not exactly a sort of um, fully representative um, aggregation of those sites. It's much more bespoke, I think, in terms of what they offer and, and what they have. But um, I think there's there's great potential in kind of reuniting objects that have been dispersed because of you know our own histories back into spaces um, you know for for many many reasons, um, uh, much much less um, uh, not only I would say educational reasons. So. Um, yeah, I think there's great potential. I don't know of anyone who's thinking on that global level um, at, the, at this, uh, uh, this time in terms of aggregating all the world's digital collections, but it's certainly possible, technically. Because that's what we did with some of the palaces. We found that the collections were dispersed all over the world. So one object might be at the Met, one at the v &A, one in Australia, and we tried to you know, put it back together, a kind of digital palace you know, of the objects no longer there, so which was really mm -hmm. fascinating. Um, a question for Anne-Marie Richards. Does provenance research include research into the untold and sometimes contested histories of how objects are acquired and flow in the art market? Um, and actually, you know, um, I met Lucien Simmons, you probably know him, um, who um, is specializing in provenance research. And I've worked with him because I've been doing a lot of research on the Jewish um, um, historic houses and, and so on. But I'd like to hear more about this. And to what extent do you think is an auction house involved in defining authenticity when it comes to art objects? Well, the, um, the provenance aspect is the history of uh, ownership. And if the ownership uh, that does not pass the smell test, so to speak, uh, the auction house has to do due diligence and be completely transparent. And as for the authenticity factor, um, auction house, top tier auction houses are responsible for a number of years uh, in, in the authenticity of the objects. But because there's been so much uh, legislation and uh, contesting of, uh, you know, for example, the famous Franz Hals um, and, and some objects of antiquities have been contested uh, not too long ago. Um, Sotheby's acquired the uh, Jamie Martin's laboratory called Orion Analytics a few years ago, uh, just to add an, another layer of uh, scientific analysis uh, in the origins of the objects. Um, so that's another measure that we try to, you know, um, kind of tick all the boxes uh, when it came to authenticity. It's not just the provenance and the connoisseurship, but also testing the materials because there's been so many scandals uh, as of late. Um, thank you. There's a question for Caitlin. Um, you talk beautifully about the object-centric pedagogy practiced by educators at the Frick Collection. I was curious about how this approach works for different audiences, be it school children in different ages, tourists, etc., in terms of accessibility. Have you ever found that it serves some particular group especially well or leaves another frustrated? Yes, thank you. And it's very nice to meet your dog. Yeah, this is Womble from the Wombles. <laughs> um, well, 
A little further down in the chat, I've addressed some of the other kinds of programs that the Frick offers, you know, recognizing that there are multiple modalities that we need to offer for learning in any museum. Um, I think something that I haven't really touched on, but that is certainly an outcome of the research and revision that, um, that I described in my presentation um, is a different sort of visit um, that focuses specifically on the Gilded Age and uses you know, the house and the collection as a, a vehicle, as, a, um, as a, um, a text in and of itself, rather than the context for thinking about the history of art. Um, and that's something that is a small fraction of the uh, visits that we um, do at the Frick, um, but it does open up doors onto you know, museum, um, museum studies, the history of collecting more broadly. Um, and I think that's an area where we've seen a lot of, of change, of, of thinking about that, that visit, not as something that's specifically focused on the history of Henry Clay Frick's interest in European art and his development from, you know, French academic painting to ultimately the old masters, um, but to something that engages more with histories of migration um, and immigration to the United States and within the United States from south to north. Um, and engaging also with histories of, of New York City um, that the Frick didn't necessarily see itself as um, as having something to offer on in the past. Of course, in a way, historic houses are tangible history. Um, it's like a time machine still, and it's, uh, this experience is also fascinating to students. And um, although you know, it is an elite um, interior, um, I think somehow to be exposed to something that is different from your own experience is a good thing. You know, I always say it's good to have um, a, you know, a view of the world um, through a window, not only through a mirror. And, and so this is a fantastic opportunity. And uh, we, we've discussed it in the past. It's also, we still need to have the sense of awe and wonder. And I think this is possibly where the different discourse or where the discourses differ from academia that is more centered on problems. Um, and, you know, <laughs> let's say heritage managers or owners of historic houses, they want to have a positive experience. And I think this is something we also saw in the pandemic because it was kind of, you know, it had a healing function for people to go to gardens and parks, you know, after being confined to, to small um, areas. So um, even if there is a complicated history, this is what I indicated in my um, uh, introduction. There are so many narratives. You also mentioned that there is the object history, the art history, the architectural history. There's the person, the collector, the people who built it, uh, who made it, who, who did the interiors and so on. So um, there is a tendency based on kind of politics, based on fashions and trends to overpower and sometimes use one narrative um, above all the others. So how do you feel about this? Right, I think there's um, one way to think about museums um, is as a place of escapism, temples to beauty. Um, and I think that, that what we're talking about here is about finding in the museum a space of engagement um, and a place for critical engagement as well. Right, um, yes. Um, if there are any more questions, we have to, it's 10 o'clock, we, uh, we need to stop. Um, our IT personnel also needs to go. You've spent a lot of time. It was a huge luxury, I think, for all of us to be able to escape from all of our other duties and listen to these uh, lectures. Uh, is there any more questions or from the speakers to the other speakers? We can take one more question, then I'd like to um, uh, finish our wonderful session. No. Great. So thanks again for participating, for coming. Really stay in touch with the Center for Historic Houses. We are really eager to collaborate with you. To um, We have many fascinating projects working with various palaces in India where we need the different expertise. We are also very keen. I said we are working with the JP Morgan um, uh, Technology Group to develop digital solutions. So we are very keen to work with all of you and um, you know to just um, offer many solutions, improve communities here and have have this kind of discourse between East and West. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.